In our study this evening, we will look at the call of Christ upon his disciples. The call of Christ. Let me read here these few verses, beginning in verse 18 and going down to verse 22. Now Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Then they immediately left their nets and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in the boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. And he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. The Lord Jesus has begun his public ministry. After his baptism, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit. He dealt with accusations, with temptations, with trials at the very hands of Satan himself. And he was victorious. And after that time of fasting and prayer and temptation and victory, the Lord Jesus headed into the region of Galilee. This is the northern area of the land of Israel around the sea called Galilee. He had begun his public ministry. He was the great light that was seen by those who sat in darkness. He was the great light to those who were under the shadow of death, as we saw. He has been preaching in the region of Galilee. He has been proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. John the Baptist had said it was nigh, it was at hand, it was at the very door. The Messiah, the Christ, is coming. He's on the way. Prepare your heart. Prepare the way for him. Jesus now proclaims the fullness of the gospel of his kingdom. The king has arrived and he is establishing his kingdom in the hearts of men all over the earth. The hearts of many were prepared by the preaching of the Baptist. The Holy Spirit was at work through the preaching of John the Baptist. There were men, there were women, there were people who heard the preaching of the Baptist and who were influenced, who were touched, who were moved by the Holy Spirit of God to believe the preaching of the Baptist, to believe that there was one coming and their hearts were prepared when he should arrive when he should make his appearance, when he should reveal himself to them, their hearts were ready to receive him. Of these who heard the Baptist, of these upon whom the Holy Spirit was moving, were some fishermen, Andrew and John by name. If you leave your finger here in the Gospel of Matthew, let's just look at a brief passage in the Gospel of John chapter 1. It has not been my intention to present a harmony of the Gospels as we have gone through Matthew. However, from time to time there are certain things that I think increase our understanding as we go through and are important as we tell the story to give a fullness to our understanding of that story. In chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, notice verse 35. And this is Coming after the baptism of Christ, it says the next day, John stood with two of his disciples. John the Baptist is there with two who have heard him and are following his teaching. And looking at Jesus as he walked, he said, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God. Now the two disciples heard him speak. They heard John say this. And so they followed Jesus then Jesus turned and, seeing them following, said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which is to say when translated, Teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and see. They came and saw where he was staying and remained with him that day. Now it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him, followed Jesus, was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, and we believe the other unnamed was John 
himself, John the fisherman that is. He first found his own brother, Andrew did, Simon, and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which has translated the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Now when Jesus looked at him, he said, You are Simon, the son of Jonah. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. Now let's head back over here to Matthew. I bring that to your attention to notice that two of the people that Jesus approaches here, actually really th three of the people, Jesus has had previous dealings with. They know who he is. They understand very clearly that this is the one that John has said, John the Baptist has said, this is the Lamb of God. This is the one of whom I was preaching about. This is the one that I told you you should follow when he comes. He's greater than I. I am not worthy to lift his sandals. He is the ultimate. He is the one about all of my preaching. The hearts of many had been prepared, and especially the hearts of these particular men. In the passage before us, we not only see the calling of Jesus' first disciples, but we are presented with a text which both encourages us and it also exhorts us. It exhorts us in our own Christian calling as disciples of the Christ. We should be ready and willing to place ourselves in the shoes of this narrative, in the very sandals of these fishermen. We need to make their story our story. They were called by Christ, and we no less in this day are called by Christ as well. The disciples, number one, are seen by Christ. Number two, the disciples are called to Christ. Number three, the disciples follow after Christ. And we want to examine this passage in that way. They were seen by Christ, they were called by Christ, and they followed after Christ. And so, number one, the disciples, these men who would become the disciples, they were seen by Christ. In verse 18, we read that Jesus, as he was walking by the sea, he saw these two brothers, Andrew and his brother Simon Peter. In verse 24, Jesus, going a little further, he sees two other brothers. He sees James and John working there with their own father. Jesus sees these men. Surely there were many fishermen that day on the shore, fishing, mending their nets, working their business, working their trade. But Jesus saw these four men in a very special and particular way. Out of the multitudes, the master chose these men. I suppose we could say he could have chose anybody, but he chose these men. The Bible over and over and over again in the New Testament speaks of us as the chosen of God. Jesus tells his own disciples over there in the Gospel of John, you didn't choose me, but I chose you. Peter, we read it last week, speaks of us as the special people of God. And I, I love in the Old Testament when the Lord speaks of Israel, his chosen nation. He says, now don't forget, I didn't choose you because you were the, the greatest. I didn't choose you because you were the wealthiest, the most powerful, the most incredible, the most amazing. I chose you simply because I desired to set my love upon you. And so there is a specialness in the calling of Christ. He could have chose anybody, but he chose these particular men. As we said, upon these particular men, the Spirit had already been at work. And so we see here the Son and the Spirit. We see Jesus and the Spirit working in harmony, working in harmony doing the Father's work. The Spirit has been at work in the hearts of these men through the preaching of John the Baptist, even through speaking with Jesus personally before now. 
And now Jesus comes to them in harmony with what the Spirit has already been doing. Jesus comes to them to make his choice of them known to them, to make them his own. There's no mistaking it now. They've had their conversations. Hey, Rabbi, where are you staying? <laughs> Come and see. They, they, they've had their dialogue. They, they, they have made their acquaintance. But now Jesus, he calls them to himself as his own. You are mine. I have come now to make you my own disciples. And he calls them, do not mistake it, to discipleship. To follow his ways, his will, his leading. To follow directly after him. Not to get ahead of him. Peter, every now and then, as you will see as we go along, sometimes he gets ahead of the Lord. Jesus has to put him back in line. Get behind me. And he calls him Satan, but we won't get into that right now. We'll pick that up in another study. But get behind me. Don't get in front of me. Follow me. You're my disciple. I am the master. You are the follower. I am the teacher. You are the student. To go further, I am the savior. You are the saved. I have purchased you. I will purchase you in this regard. But to us, Jesus would say, I've purchased you with my own blood. Paul explains in the Corinthian letter that we have been bought at a price and we are not our own to do as we please. We belong to the Lord for Jesus Christ has purchased us with his own blood. And so Jesus sees these men, these fishermen, and he approaches them to make them his own. We continue. Number two, the disciples here are now called directly by Christ. He makes his intentions known to them. Jesus approaches these fishermen in the midst of their daily affairs. This is not in the synagogue on the Sabbath. This is not as they were doing some religious thing. Jesus approaches them right in the middle of their life, right in the middle of their business, right in the middle of what they would naturally be doing. And he calls them. He calls them to be his personal disciples. First, we must see that he confronts them with his sovereign position. He is the master. He is their master. Follow me. He expects that this word should be obeyed. He speaks to them with authority. He speaks to them as his own. He exercises authority over them. He expects their immediate attention. He expects their faithful obedience. He expects their reverence. He anticipates their attention and their devotion. Follow me. Walk with me. Live for me. Learn of me. Come with me. This part of your life, like I said, he, he approached them in the midst of their daily affairs. That which they were used to doing. Right in the middle of that, he says, this is no longer your business. I am calling you out of your former life. I am calling you into a new life. Follow me. Come after me. Come after me follow me. And he exercises his sovereign position over them. He speaks to them as if they should listen. He speaks to them as if they should obey. He, d he doesn't approach them and have a discussion about why they should listen to him, about why they should follow him, about, hey, when someone comes to you, perhaps uh, with a job offer, well, what are the benefits? What are the pay? What can I expect? And they attempt to convince you, if they desire to hire you, they want to convince you to come into their company. Jesus makes no such discussion with them. He approaches them and he says, follow me. And he exercises his sovereign authority over them. His sovereign position over them and expects them to comply. Second, 
His call is forceful. In the Greek, it's dute, come, and it's imperative, come, come now. Follow me, follow me now. This is not an invitation. Hey guys, I, I saw you fishing here. You guys look like you know what you're doing. I, I think you could handle my business affairs because it looks like the business affairs here are well taken care of. I think you should come and follow me. This is not an invitation, it is a command. The chosen of God are called to follow Christ and it is a command. He calls, he commands, he demands, he is Lord and calls. He calls his people to bow their knee to his will. He calls, he does not beg. There is no plea going on here. The shepherd calls and he calls his own. And his own sheep hear his voice and they follow him. Now some do not hear his voice. They are not his. This calling is not given to them. He calls his own unto himself. He calls and he has authority over them. His own yield, they yield to his hand. They yield to his will, his direction, his leading. They yield to his word and to his voice. His call is forceful. And it is no less forceful today over our lives than it was in that day over the lives of these fishermen. We may neglect his calling, but if we truly hear his voice, if we are truly his, we cannot neglect it forever. But we must answer and we must yield. There are many who are not his sheep, and Jesus would say to those people, well, that's why you don't believe in me. That's why, if I can put it in Matthew's context, you don't follow me because you're not mine. But to his own he calls, and his own yield to his call. Third, his call is powerful. I will make you, and in the context of these men's lives, I will make you fishers of men. But over each person that he has called into his flock, over each person that he has called to follow him, there is something that you could bracket right there. What will he make of you? These men were destined to be his evangelist, to spread the gospel all around the world. The Lord, his call is powerful. His calling, as they say, is his enabling. What has he called you to be? What has he called you to do? Come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. Now, I think if we spoke to Andrew and to Simon Peter, if we spoke to James and John, at this particular juncture, at the very beginning of their call, and if we told them, Hey, do you guys think you could be evangelists? Hey, Peter, do you think you could stand up in the midst of Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost and preach the gospel to thousands? I'm sure that they would stagger at the promises of God. Oh, I can't do that. I am unable to do that. They might sound like Moses in the Old Testament. Lord, I can't do what you've asked of me. I'm not an eloquent speaker. I stagger, I stutter, I can't do this. And yet the Lord made Moses the leader of a great and mighty multitude. And through Moses, he dealt with Pharaoh in a mighty and powerful way. There was Gideon that cowered in the book of Judges, who God made brave before the enemy, before the armies that were attacking his people. And of course, there is Peter. Peter and John both. Enough of their lives is recorded in the New Testament for us to see that the Lord was able to take them and to make them into what he desired. The potter does have power over the clay to take this simple, ordinary clay and to make it into something awesome 
and majestic and beautiful and fit for the master's use. Peter could one day stand up on the day of Pentecost and preach to thousands. John, a, a man of very powerful emotions who could get very angry. We see him in another uh, gospel story desiring to call fire out of heaven to destroy those people who would mock the Lord Jesus. And yet, as the Spirit moved upon his life, Jesus was able to make of him a true fisher of men, the apostle of love, who was able to take the love of God and pour it into the lives of people. The Lord was able to take away that, that fleshly anger and to replace it with something that was fit for the master's use. Somebody full of hate was able to be filled with the love of Christ. His call, it is sovereign. He expects us to listen. It is forceful. It is imperative. And his call is powerful. His call is powerful. He is able to make us into that which will glorify himself. And he is also able to make us into that which is fitting for his use, which gives us purpose in life and gives us, his instrument, great joy as the master uses us. The true disciple finds great joy in the ministry of the master in service to the master. We glorify the Lord as we obey his call. We glorify the Lord as he is able to make us into fishers of men, into that thing that he has purposed us to be. And as we find that purpose, indeed, we have fullness of joy as we follow the Lord Jesus. Number three, the disciples are seen by Christ. They are called to Christ. Number three, the disciples follow after Christ. The text tells us that they acted immediately. They didn't wait. They didn't linger. They did not delay. And they acted decisively. They left their nets. The other brothers left not only their nets, they left their boats, they left their father. <laughs> they were obedient. They followed the master's call. They followed the master himself. As Jesus calls these fishermen, these ordinary men, these simple fishermen, they answer in dramatic fashion. And the dramatic fashion in which they answer this call is a demonstration of the truth of their calling. Their response is proof of their submission to Jesus as the Christ. They are indicating that indeed his authority over them is rightful and proper and that he is deserving of their allegiance. See, I made a big deal about his exercising sovereign authority over them because others, perhaps other fishermen, they could look on and say, what are you talking about, Jesus? You want these guys to leave their business and follow you? Well, who do you think you are? What right do you think you have? The answer of these men demonstrates that indeed, they believe that Jesus has this authority over them, that he is their sovereign, that what he has asked of them is both rightful and it is proper, and it is deserving of their faithful obedience and of their loyal allegiance. They act decisively. They drop their nets. They abandon their boats. And the other brothers leave their father with the hired help. You recall in the gospel stories, there was a man who came to Christ and he says, hey, I want to follow you, but let me first go bury my father. Let me go first deal with the responsibilities I have to my household, to my father. It sounds reasonable. And yet when you strip away the natural reasonableness of it, when you strip away the seeming rationale behind it, is it not just an excuse not 
to follow Christ? Is it not actually a demonstration, simple as, simple as it may be, a demonstration that Christ is not my sovereign? He is not my shepherd. I do not obey his voice. I do not come after him. There's something else that I must do. I cannot seek the kingdom because I have my own affairs which are governing my actions, my conduct, my behavior. It sounds reasonable and so often the world, they'll look at us, they'll say, well, pff, it's not reasonable that I should do that or it is reasonable that I should do this. They rationalize their sin. They give reasons and excuses for why they should not follow the Christ. Well, I'm glad he works for you, but it's just not really my thing. They might even sound very polite about it. But at its core, it's a demonstration. He is not my sovereign. He is not my Lord. He is not my king. He is not my shepherd. He does not have authority over me, for I am not his. Oh, we wouldn't want to say it like that. Oh, we don't want to say it like that. Somebody might say, well, I, you know, I, I would almost become a Christian, but there are things I have to do. You know, I, I really don't have time for church because I have to be busy about these affairs. Oh, I, I can't come to learn of Christ. There are things I have to do. And they sound so honest, so sincere in their excuses, but they are nothing more than excuses. They are nothing more than a demonstration than Christ is not mine. I am not his. And so I do not heed his voice. He has no authority over me. But these men, these simple fishermen, they act in extremely dramatic fashion. It would have made an impression on those around them. This man, who by this time is well known, some believe he's the Messiah, and he has asked Andrew and Simon Peter, he has asked James and John, hey, stop what you're doing, I want you to follow me. And they don't argue. They don't have a discussion. They don't say, wait, let me go take care of my father. They drop their nets, they leave their boats, and those two brothers left their father. Now, I don't believe Jesus caused them to leave their father rudely. I don't think they ignored him when he was calling after them. What are you doing? I am sure they turned to him and says, Dad, Jesus has called us. We believe he's the Messiah. We're following after him. And they left. And they went. They acted decisively. And they acted obediently as they followed after Jesus. He is their Lord. They follow Him. They follow His lead. They heed His voice. They hear His word. It causes them to act, to behave in a certain way, to do certain things. They are obedient to what he says, and they have made a commitment to be obedient to whatever he will say. He is their Lord. We are going to follow him. He is sovereign over us. In conclusion, as we look at the call of Christ over these men, let us think about the call of Christ over our own lives. As the chosen people of God, we are expected to answer the call of Christ in no less dramatic fashion than these men did. To follow after him. We are expected to turn away from the former things that held us before we found him, before he found us. We are expected to turn away from the things of the world. We are expected to turn away from all things that would keep us from following him. We are expected to live for Jesus Christ. We are expected to heed his word, to seek first his kingdom, to walk as he walked, ever pleasing the Father. We are expected to prove that good and acceptable and perfect will of God in our lives. We are expected to be faithful stewards over everything he has given us in our lives, over our time, over our resources, whatever it might be. We are expected to be faithful in every regard in our lives to the Lord Jesus. We are expected to be faithful to his church, building up and edifying our fellow saints. We are expected to be unceasing in prayer, 
to be seasoned with grace, to be abounding in love and in the work of the Lord. We are expected to heed the call of Christ. And make no mistake about it, those that follow Christ, they are Christ. They belong to Him. They are His. Those who do not follow Christ, as polite as they might be, as reasonable as we might sound, if we do not follow Christ, if we do not hear His voice and heed His call, we are not of His. We do not belong to Him. Oh, believer, make your calling and election sure. Your calling. Can you hear His call over your life? Is He sovereign over your life? Do you demonstrate His sovereignty by heeding the words of His voice and by living as He has called you to live? Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this wonderful story of Jesus and His first disciples as He calls them to follow after Him. Lord, it's so simple. But this simple call is truly what divides the light from the darkness, divides the sheep from the goats, divides the saints of, of heaven from those who are of the world. Father, might we demonstrate by the lives that we live that we truly belong to the Son. And Lord Jesus, would you bring us back here on Wednesday as we gather for prayer? Would you keep us safe? and bring us back together again in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen.